Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our latest edition of today's State of the Consumer. Um, today's topic is the holiday season, the Thanksgiving season and the Christmas season, um, or whatever you celebrate, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, whatever it may be, um, and how consumers are going to be acting, behaving differently, and how that manifests into them spending differently. And I'm really excited to present this today. Uh, this is now our 13th State of the Consumer webinar. We've officially reached our State of the Consumer of Bat Mitzvah or Bar Mitzvah. Um, we have been doing these since March. It has been quite a ride um, since March 10th when the world changed and our company at Suzy went fully remote, as I know. Basically, everyone who's watching and listening today went remote as well. Um, one thing we have tried to continually do um, throughout this global pandemic is use our Suzy Consumer Insights tool to keep our clients and partners and industries at large um, with their fingers on the pulse of the changing nature of the consumer. There's been so much change that's occurred in the last six months, and now it's more important than ever before that companies in all industries really, uh, you know, listen and understand the way that consumers are, are behaving differently because it's going to have a massive impact um, on, you know, all types of businesses uh, moving forward. Um, we have a very special guest today. So I'd like to welcome Joe Keenan, who is our editor in chief of Total Retail. Joe, hopefully you'll be popping up on our screen um, any second and uh, we're going to get started. So uh, let's uh, snap our fingers and there we go. Here's Joe. Joe, thanks so much for joining today. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Matt. I'm happy yeah, to be here. Absolutely. So Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit about Total Retail? Sure, yeah. So Total Retail um, is a digital media publication. Obviously, we um, cover the retail space with a uh, focus on uh, retail marketing in particular. Um, and we do that through a number of different products. We host uh, our own live and virtual events. We uh, produce a daily e-newsletter. We have a podcast. We have a video series. So pretty much you name the, uh, the media channel that uh, or content channel we produce in it. So uh, and uh, I oversee kind of all content direction and production for Total Retail. That's great. And you guys obviously cover the e-commerce space quite intensively as well, I'd imagine. Of course, yep, uh, and uh, we're going to get into that, but uh, a growing, growing part of the business for sure. That's for sure, absolutely. Uh, for those of you who don't know Susie that are on a phone, we are a real-time market research platform. We work with over 250 leading enterprises and really helping them conduct on-demand research to understand uh, their consumer, any type of consumer, to get instant same meeting results to help drive business decisions. And we used our Suzy tool to conduct primary research that's going to be really fueling our uh, presentation today. Uh, most recently, we conducted a study in September with a sample size of 1,000 Americans directionally represent the U.S. consumers and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So when we are quoting uh, data from Susie today, it will be data from this study. Um, so today's webinar is about what we're calling the uh, tis the season for uncertainty. Uh, you know, we all know that so many businesses rely on the holiday season for the bulk of their revenue and income every year. And right now, obviously, there's unprecedented uncertainty for so many businesses that have long relied on the holiday season to drive their volume. Uh, the 2019 holiday season feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, yesterday, I saw a couple of our employees and one of them came up and tried to shake my hand. They said, what do you think it is, 2019? Um, and that's basically how things have changed. You know, We're not really shaking hands or hugging each other anymore. Um, and a lot has changed, obviously, with the holiday season. Last year, uh, December 1st of 2019, marked the busiest travel day um, in TSA's 18-year history. So we're less than a year uh, apart from what was essentially the busiest travel day in history. And now here we are, we're traveling so many major markets, especially international travel, uh, is all but shut down. Uh, obviously, a big question we have right now is when will people feel safe to rush to airports? I know it's slowly coming back. I watched an interview with the CEO of Delta yesterday that saying certain markets, especially in the southeast, some of the Midwest uh, regions are starting to slowly pick back up, but still tremendous slowness on the coast, namely places like Seattle, L.A., San Francisco, New York, et cetera, which obviously make up the bulk of their volume, especially when it comes to business travel. Um, 
2019 was an incredible holiday sales season with over a trillion in sales for the first time. Um, Joe, how big was the 2019 season in terms of retail and what were the key drivers behind that last year? Yeah, I think some of the key drivers, uh, to your point, in, 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 a, in a very successful uh, holiday season last year was one, the uh, economy. You know, we look at the economic climate in last December and last November, record unemployment, uh, higher wages in certain cases for most workers. That was driving consumer spending. There was consumer confidence at that time, um, which led to that record sa uh, in, uh, sales uh, for retailers. And, and that, you know, not only um, that, but we had uh, not the climate we're operating in today, where there's consumer reluctance about going in store. Uh, you know, in, in 2019, like you said, less than 12 months ago, but it's completely flipped on its head. Consumers are are less willing to go stand in a crowded store um, to make a purchase. Um, they're going to do that online, and obviously, there's the shift in the economic climate and consumer confidence. So. Uh, looking back at last year, uh, was high times for retailers. It'll be interesting yeah. to see how it plays out in 2020. It sure will. It sure will. Um, you know, one question we all have is for 4 a.m. Black Friday lines exist this year. We all think not. Uh, you know, that rush to the stores on Black Friday that we're so used to seeing on the news the day after Thanksgiving, we all know will not be the same um, this year. Uh, you know, last year, omni-channel retails like Amazon um, had their, well, Amazon's more of an e-commerce player, but even players like Walmart, who is really obviously rapidly expanding their digital play, had their best uh, holiday season um, ever last year. One thing, Joe, you and I were talking about before the webinar today is that Amazon now has sort of shifted up or in some ways shifted back the calendar because Prime Day last year was in July. Um, this year, for a variety of reasons, they pushed it back to October 13th and 14th, um, which just ended yesterday. I made sure to buy a bunch of useless stuff or slightly below what I would normally pay, <laughs> as so many consumers did. Um, what was behind this timing, Joe, and, and how do you think it will impact this year's holiday season? Yeah, so Amazon, when they launched Prime Day, I believe it was four years ago at this point, maybe five, um, they, they chose kind of a slow, kind of dead period almost in the retail calendar. That's the reason for they dropped it in mid-July. Um, typically not, a, not, a, you know, not many uh, consumer holidays around that point after July 4th. Um, obviously, things changed this year and it got pushed back because of COVID. Um, and now, uh, kind of looking at consumer behavior for this year's Prime Day, Many are saying, and, and I would tend to agree with this, that it's going to be kind of the unofficial kickoff to the holiday shopping season. What used to be Black Friday is the unofficial kickoff to the uh, holiday season. I think it's going to be replaced by Prime Day this year. I think we've seen really? an acceleration of, uh, of the timeline. Um, if you looked at some of the statistics around Prime Day going into it, the number of people that reported that they were going to be uh, purchasing for others, gift buying versus self uh, purchasing, uh, was way up in terms of the gift buying behavior of consumers. So uh, I think that's one key thing that we're going to see come out of Prime Day is, is the amount of gift purchasing that occurred. And I just want to go back to one thing on the Omni Channel from uh, pr from previous in terms of uh, Omni Channels had the best holiday season ever last year. And I think it'll be interesting this year looking at kind of um, how the physical retailers kind of transform themselves. When I, you know, when I say the physical retailers, the, the traditional brick and mortars that you always think of, the Walmarts, the Targets, the Home Depots, those companies of the world, they've already kind of been working towards this omni-channel um, operating models. And it's become even, like I said, even more accelerated because of COVID. Like, like, so like, think, oh, it's like buy online, pick up in store. You, you read my mind, yeah. Matt. Yeah. I think that, I, I think, the BOPIS, um, and, and even even more so critically, is the contactless curbside. I think we're seeing uh, the retailers that have that capability and can get kind of their ducks in a row, and that's a big ask because it's a lot of inventory management and kind of getting your system set up. But curbside could be a huge differentiator for your physical retailers this year. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so it'll be interesting to see going back to Prime Day. I mean, it seems so early for holiday shopping, but then again, consumers have more time, uh, you know, discretionary time, so to yeah. speak, than ever before. And obviously, if they can get deals and stash stuff in their homes, maybe that's, you know, what they're thinking about. So what will shopping look like in socializing 2020? Who knows? Today, we're going to dive into our report right now, and we're focused on really the bookends of the holiday season. First, we're going to start about Thanksgiving, which is less about um, – holiday shopping, but more about setting the tone for how consumers are behaving heading into the holiday season. Because obviously when you look at spending, 
there's one pie chart, no pun intended, with the yummy pie on the turkey day slide you're looking at, but uh, there's one pie chart of expenditures for consumers. And in my opinion, you know, with consumers spending less on travel, which so many consumers traditionally spend so much money on, there's just going to be more money in their pocket. Savings rates for U.S. consumers are at an all-time high. Obviously, it's you know a story of two consumers because you have one set of consumers um, in America that are dramatically struggling right now and, and out of work and and really struggling to make ends meet. But then there's the other set of consumers that have been gainfully employed through this that have an all-time high savings rate and entering a holiday season where they don't they aren't going to be traveling over thanksgiving as we're going to get into that could be a big driver uh, of, of spending during the holiday season so talking about um you know thanksgiving season before we jump into it uh, for those of you who have been part of our prior say the consumer webinars we're going to go in our special section ask america we're going to allow you the audience to um pick what question we ask our Susie panel um, to answer before the end of the webinar. And the first question is, um, you know, about Thanksgiving. Uh, one, uh, do you want to know if our consumers plan to see uh, their older family members this year? Um, do you plan on shopping during Black Friday Cyber Money for yourself? Do you expect brands to do more in celebration of Thanksgiving? And do you plan to shop for vacations this year uh, for 2021? So our consumers actually think about traveling earlier. So you can go ahead and select whatever question you'd like us to ask our audience and we will get into it. Um, so uh, the first part of Thanksgiving, just going kind of in chronological, chronological order is called Drinksgiving, uh, which is really the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. And this is a huge night traditionally, especially in the last decade, uh, for, um, you know, wine, spirits, beers, companies, um, just because it's, you know, traditionally a, a time when, uh, you know, companies are able to hit their audience with consumers who are traveling home, generally back to their hometowns, uh, you know, for, for the holiday season. Um, every year, Drinksgiving spikes alcohol sales at bars and restaurants. And 2016, they were up nearly 300%. Uh, in the beer category and up over 100% on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So a huge uh, kind of category driver uh, for companies um, in the beer, wine, uh, and spirits category. And this year, three quarters of young adults do not plan to travel at all during Thanksgiving. So if you have young millennials who are just say age um, 21 to uh, 35 that are home that uh, are away from home that may want to traditionally go back to their parents and where they grew up and, and flood the bars that Wednesday night, which we've often seen, that's not really going to be happening this year. So that's going to be a volume driver that these companies really have to make up for. You see companies like Heineken really trying to differentiate with their packaging. Um, this is a promotion they're doing, which has essentially a technology behind it that allows them to distribute uh, millions of different uh, types of packaging that you can be customized for yourself, really, again, to drive volume. So this is a brand experience, really replicating the on-premise physical experience that consumers will not be getting this holiday season, um, and in part because there are no more drinks giving uh, heading into this year. Another kind of trendy word in the industry we've um, heard of was Friendsgiving. Uh, this is driven by urbanization and millennials um, staying in cities and those who don't travel home and to see their family have been getting together with their friends traditionally. But this year, again, due to the pandemic, only 10 percent plan on hosting a Friendsgiving and only 10 percent plan on attending. So, you know, that that data is kind of holding up that, you know, that category is basically going to be all but diminished this year as well. Um, older adults are really struggling um, this year from uncertain plans. Um, you know, oh, nearly a third of 60 to 72 year olders, so you're getting down to senior market, don't know what they're going to be doing for Thanksgiving. And um, it's really been isolating for older people um, to really um, make up for the fact that they're not going to be surrounded with their friends and family during a time when they really look forward to it. Um, we're actually sadly seeing in a lot of nursing homes and things of that nature, the rise of robotic pets that people are uh, buying at, at older ages because they're not allowed to, for, for a variety of reasons, bring pets into nursing homes and things of that nature. So I think it's an opportunity for all of us, just putting aside business for a second, to support your elders and loved ones who are definitely going to be probably struggling more than most of us during um, this holiday season. Um, over those who are traveling, 86% are motivated, obviously seeing family. That's the main reason uh, why they're doing it. The question is how they're going to get home. And the overwhelming majority of what we're hearing is they're going to be traveling 
uh, via car. Um, 70% say they want the safety and privacy of a car. Um, it's interesting because we saw the bankruptcy um, of Hertz earlier this year. And I actually thought when this pandemic was first starting, if you go back to the very first day of the consumer webinar in March, I said, I thought this was going to drive the boom of rental car usage. Um, and you do see uh, the auto category um, being driven up, but it's not actually through car rentals. It's actually through uh, car purchases. Used cars are having an incredible moment right now as consumers know that they can't fly. You see a company like Carvana stock um, over 200, nearly 200% this year. Um, as consumers, you know, understand that they can't travel via airplane to see their family. So they're, they're buying their own car. And we're also seeing obviously lots of articles about consumers leaving, um, you know, highly dense metropolitan areas like New York and San Francisco. And with that, obviously they're not using as much public transportation and they are using the automobile. Joe, just curiously, like this is a bigger trend um, that I'm seeing kind of outside the holiday season, so to speak. But do you believe that with consumers maybe um, vacating cities and maybe, maybe moving to secondary and tertiary cities, I think Scottsdale uh, or Columbus, Ohio, that the, it's with that, it's going to drive more proliferation of vehicles, which has been under pressure, which means they're going to be more likely to jump in the car and go to Target or Walmart and fill up their SUV. Like, is that going to, does that put pressure on the e-commerce rise or do you not see it that way? I, I don't necessarily know if I see it that way. I do think the auto industry is is, is a chance to see a, a nice boom a nice boon here. But um, in terms of them getting into the car and driving to the local Walmart or the local uh, Target or whatever the case may be, uh, I'm still at least for the time being I'm a little, little less bullish on that. I agree. Of, uh, in terms of I, I really think in what we've seen since you know when this pandemic really took took hold of our country in in, in early March, as you noted. Um, is that you're seeing a lot of consumers that always shopped in store. Now they tested e-commerce for the first time and they're then, you know, realizing, okay, if they've had a good experience and they, they're recognizing the convenience, the safety of it. So I think you're going to see some of those first time consumers and you were talking to the senior population. I think that's a big growth, a great sure growth is. factor for the uh, e-commerce industry. Um, so I, and so I, I'm less bullish on, on kind of the, um, getting into the car and driving to the store, but but to the specific of the auto industry, yeah, I think there's an opportunity there. Which actually, I wanted to touch on one other thing uh, yeah. in terms of specific verticals. I think have a real great, uh, you know, have, have, we've seen, and I think there's continued growth opportunities for some verticals during the um, during the pandemic and during the holiday yeah. season. Uh, anything related to home, so home improvement, yeah. furniture. We're going to definitely go deep into okay. that. Okay, so we, we can get in there. Yeah, yeah. That. yeah. I think I, 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 and I think the point you touched on is interesting. Where you, a lot of people think that some of these companies that are benefiting from the pandemic, um, e-commerce specifically, are going to just have a reversal of fortunes uh, when God willing, there's a vaccine coming up soon. I'm with you, Joe. I think that once you view something like Instacart to have groceries delivered to your home, which many consumers have been forced to do during the pandemic. I don't see why they would go back to going into the grocery store just because you can again. It's a time saver. It's in many instances a cost saver. And I think once you've kind of flipped over, why would you flip back? And you have seen companies like whether it's Michael's um, or Lemon or Nike, so many of these companies that really thrived during the pandemic because they had very robust digital uh, you know, e-commerce e infrastructures in place heading into it. And they've really taken advantage of it um, compared to like a local retailer here in New York called Century 21, which as you know, just yep. filed for bankruptcy. Why? Because they didn't have an e-commerce infrastructure. Everything was based on the sewer experience. So yeah. I couldn't agree with you more on that yeah. point. And just to add one point, and I think yours is a good one, uh, the caveat to that, and I think you've cited the Nikes, the Lululemon, they had the infrastructure, they were prepared um, for this. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, it's all about the experience. So if I'm buying you know, online from an, a, a company for the first time and I have a lousy experience, uh, whether it's on site, whether you know they tell me the product's available, I get to the checkout page, I go to put my info in, and then all of a sudden I get an out of stock message. It, you know, it's that I'm not, it, those retailers aren't going to see the return of those customers. But if they have a good experience, you go to Nike.com, you get this, you know, the running sneakers you want, and it's at my door the next day, and I'm happy with them. I'm more likely to go back and shop to, you know, that that site again. So I think uh, it comes down to the getting the experience right. Um, but you know, Absolutely. being a big part of that. Yeah, and going back to Thanksgiving because I do think 
you know, these habits are important because Thanksgiving, it, it, it's all about the consumer journey, right? So the consumer journey traditionally has been about traditions, right? It's like Thanksgiving and then the day after Thanksgiving, um, you know, people are home and you jump right into Black Friday and, um, you know, families go shopping together and we mm -hmm. see that and then they go back to work and it's Cyber Monday. And the fact that these traditions are getting thrown out, um, you know, they impact everything else. So for example, 47% of respondents don't plan on cooking a turkey this year. Why? Because they're not going to be home with their families. And so I think that Thanksgiving this year is going to look nothing like Thanksgiving has in the past, the actual holiday. Um, you have brands also that are realizing it. Uh, you know, Kleenex um, basically is, is implementing a campaign where if you know someone's feeling sick or unwell or having mental health issues, you actually can send them a, a, a gift pack driven by the Kleenex uh, platform and then people um, post a photo of it. And it's just brands are trying to, uh, you know, really be also empathetic on what's happening. Um, and people are expecting brands to step it up and make their Thanksgiving special. We ask consumers, what brands do you expect um, to really step it up in terms of just social responsibility, giving back during the holiday season? And what came back loud and clear was Walmart and Amazon. Uh, does that surprise you in terms of brands really expecting these retailers to kind of give back, whether it be through discounts or otherwise, Joe? Yeah, I think from the individual brand perspective, they're going to look to the the top of the line, uh, the the major players in the space, the Walmarts, the Amazons. Uh, but I think it comes also, you know, from a, a brand perspective too. Uh, aside from the retailers, the direct to consumer opportunity. And I, I, yeah. I think we can want to talk about that, but there's really uh, you know, if your brand, you know, wasn't going into this um, selling direct to consumer, I think you need to reevaluate because there's an opportunity there. Um, so I think that's one major uh, play for, for the individual brands is, is to sell direct to consumer. Yeah. So let's get into shopping around the Thanksgiving season. So um, a third still plan to participate in black Friday that's down from 63% of Black Friday shoppers last year. So what do you, I mean, that's a major drop off. What do you, what do you, is that surprising you, Joe? Or what do you, what do you attribute that to? Yeah, I don't, it doesn't necessarily surprise me. I think there's a couple factors at play. One, obviously, um, you know, avoidance of crowds. I think people are, are, yeah. are concerned about that. But two, I think, you know, I think back to what we were talking about earlier, if they're getting a good experience on e-commerce, I think that's converting a lot of people and they're finding, you know, right. I, I can, I, I'm having this, um, and you know, with the delivery speeds at which, uh, most retailers are turning products around, I can, you kind of are still getting that instant gratification that used to get, you know, one of the reasons you went to the store is, you know, I want it and I want it now. I want to walk out with it, you know, that's same right. day shipping, next day shipping is kind of now becoming the store, the standard norm. Um, uh, so I think, uh, that, you know, the reluctance of people to get in, into crowded uh, physical stores and also just the, the value that they now see in, in, in having an e-commerce experience is going to uh, depress some of those in-store numbers for Black Friday and I think throughout the holiday season. Yeah, but you know, at the same time, Cyber Monday, mm -hmm. so it kind of goes both ways, right? Because as we talked about, Cyber Monday traditionally has been the big e-commerce start to the holiday season. Just in terms of the traditional calendar, everyone gets back from the Thanksgiving travel. They're at work on a slow Monday after Thanksgiving, you know, trying to wake up from eating too much uh, tryptophan in their turkey. And yeah. uh, what are they doing? They're not working. They're shopping online. But now people are going to, sounds like they're going to be doing that starting at Prime Day, which happened, ended yesterday, all the way through. So what does that mean? Are brands going to pull up their Cyber Monday deals? Are there still going to be Cyber Monday deals? What are your thoughts on that? I, I think there will be Cyber Monday deals, but to, to what you were saying, I think we're going to see um, less emphasis on that day itself. I think it's turned right. into more of a, you know, and we've started to see this in recent years where it's become almost Cyber Week um, yeah. rather than just Cyber Monday, kind of the elongation of that. Um, and, you know, less, less importance on that Monday, because to your point, this was Going back when the, this coin, this term was coined, it was the you know person in the office trying to get some shopping done, hiding it from the boss. Um, right. People are at home; they're shopping, you know, twenty four seven now online. So I think the actual Cyber Monday date is less relevant uh, than it used to be. But uh, I certainly think that it's an opportunity for brands and, and retailers to market around a specific event. But I think the value of that one day is is again being depressed a little bit as well. 
So it seems like we're, it's going to be just less lumpy this holiday yeah. season where there might have been big pushes of volume on Black Friday and Cyber Monday. But now with Prime Day starting and to your point, if that's the beginning of the holiday season, it stretches it out. And those, that big lumpiness in between, um, you know, that date and Christmas is, is not going to be there. So it seems that's just going to be more of a consistent um, selling uh, period and, and an elongated uh, selling period. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you there. Yeah, and then there you go. Apple obviously mm-hmm. has a huge chunk of holiday spending each year. You know, everybody, it's probably no surprise and uh, connect it with all the, and, and one thing about Apple, which is interesting is we probably don't realize this, but a year ago, Apple wasn't selling its products on Amazon, right? They were trying to protect their brand and only selling directly to consumers and, or through other, um, you know, channels like Best Buy. And now here is Apple a year later using Amazon as a way to drive their volume. One of the biggest movers of volume on Prime Day this year has been AirPods, uh, right? These AirPods that have been uh, discounted and, and moving off the shelves dramatically on, on Prime Day. And now here you go, Apple announcing the iPhone 12 right in conjunction with Prime Day uh, as consumers are just starting to think about the holidays. Is that a coincidence or is that sort of, you think, planned by Apple uh, to kind of be part of this overall story? Oh, I don't think there's anything that's not planned by Apple in terms yeah. of a product launch like that. I think you bring up a good point though, and, and this is you know goes back to the brand discussion that we had a couple slides ago, is marketplaces. Is, you know, brands have sometimes been reluctant. They lose that kind of control by selling their product on Amazon or eBay or whatever, Alibaba, whatever the marketplace may be. Uh, maybe this is, you know, an opportunity to reevaluate. Um, uh, marketplaces aren't going away. They're growing in, they're growing in status. Um, you know, brands might want to consider the smaller brand that wants to get their kind of product out there, their brand name out there. Uh, the Amazons of the world uh, could provide that. So that, that's an interesting yeah. uh, opportunity to, to look at. And on marketplaces, I mean, you're probably well aware of the the crazy rise in stock price from Etsy this year, for mm-hmm. example. Yep. Um, yep. They still a strong force in retail. So, you know, when I think about marketplaces, I think about companies like eBay and Etsy, which are more peer to peer marketplaces where small business people who may make up their own crafts and jewelry, et cetera, can sell it direct to other consumers, which obviously is the very polar opposite of a company like a- Apple, which, you know, is a multi trillion dollar company at this point. But yep. uh, I think that, you know, I think you're going to continue to see a rise of those players as well. Yeah, for sure. Etsy, just a, a, an aside on that, we, we produce our fastest growing retailers report and it's based over year over year net sales on, on publicly traded company, retail companies. And Etsy was in our top 10 this year. Wow. Um, what was number What was number one? Chewy, which is another Chewy, online. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So it's case and, then, and then there's Shopify as well, obviously, which is powering the smaller retailer. And, you know, all those companies obviously has seen a tremendous boom uh, during the pandemic. So now we're going to head to our second Ask America question to start off our winter holiday section. So you can tell us what you'd like us to ask our audience um, and we'll be answered at the end of this webinar. One, do you plan on self-gifting as much as you're getting gifting others this year? Two, how likely are you to gift a pet to someone who's lonely this year. That's interesting. Three, are you planning to try new recipes this holiday season? And four, do you plan to experiment new cocktails at home this holiday season? Um, so that's interesting. And um, while we're doing this, I also want to give a quick plug uh, to our first ever State of the Consumer Summit uh, that is occurring next week, October 27th at 1 p.m. Um, we are basically boiling all of our uh, insights that we've had this year into one two-day long event for our friends and our customers. And we're going to bring on partners like Unilever, Microsoft, PepsiCo, Mondelez, et cetera, to talk about um, you know how they are looking at the consumer heading into 2021. So be sure to register and not miss that uh, next week. We've been working really hard on it. So jumping really uh, further into the to the holiday season, um, right now, 40% of people don't know what their uh, plans are yet for the holiday winter break. So that's obviously something that's unprecedented. By now, almost everyone who was planning on traveling um, during the holiday break would have made those plans by now. But the uncertainty, and I think people are holding out hope that maybe, you know, um, you know, if they listen to certain news channels that everyone would have a vaccine by now, it's obviously uh, not occurring yet. And because of that, that they're still unsure what they're going to be doing. Um, obviously, the virus is doesn't really care about the holiday season or about the election or anything like that. It's going to do what it's going to do. And 12 U.S. states just hit record uh, case counts and people are, you know, thinking about the second wave. And it's really interesting, Joe, like when, you know, 
there's two things that are really driving the, the market in general right now. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on both. The first of which is the stimulus, right? So what the market agree believes that is if there is a um, bipartisan support for a stimulus, it's going to really drive shopping this holiday season because it's going to put money back in consumers' pockets. And we're going to see that volume. So, you know, I, I've read one story where many people think that the stimulus is actually just going to all end up at Walmart and Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. Consumers get the money into their bank account and push it back to Walmart and Amazon. And then the second driver um, is, is obviously the virus. And the, the quicker the country gets its arms around the virus, the quicker consumers may go back to how they've shopped before. We both had spoken about maybe that won't occur. Just curious your thoughts, like how big is the stimulus for retailers? How closely are they watching it um, from, the, from the retailer side versus just what Wall Street is saying? Yeah, from a retailer perspective, I think there's probably no bigger problem. Looks like I, lo I lost your... Uh, you got me now, Matt? You, Joe, let me just see. I can't hear you for some reason, so let me just see what's going on here. Can you hear me now, Matt? Abel, can you just pop on right now and just make sure that we're able to hear Joe? Because for some reason, I'm not getting him on audio. I hear you, and I can hear Joe. Okay. Abel, why don't you keep running running the webinar, if that's cool, and I'm going to pop back okay. on my audio. So take it from here. Okay. Yeah, uh, and I'll, and I'll, I'll uh, just answer Matt's question in terms of, um, what the stimulus potentially means for retailers. Yeah, from a retailer perspective, I'd say there's no bigger proponent of getting that stimulus package passed, you know, a bipartisan uh, package passed than, than the retailers themselves. Uh, it, it just drives consumer confidence. And we saw this, um, you know, at the start of the pandemic when there was a, uh, the first stimulus package was, was uh, passed, we saw some of that money being um, filtered towards retail purchases. Um, and then when that, bonus money started to dry up, but then we then saw kind of a, a pullback in terms of spending. Uh, so as we move into the holiday season, if that stimulus package does in fact get to get through, um, I think that we will see an, an uptick again um, as we move into uh, the, you know, November, December timeframe in terms of, of peak holiday purchasing. Yeah. I, I think I'm back. You guys, good. thank you, Abel, for yep. pulling in as always there. Um, yeah. I, I actually was able to catch the, the last part of that. Yeah, so basically, you think that if the stimulus hits the consumer, we will see another resurgence in spending. So it does matter a lot for consumers. For sure, uh, yeah. And that's a driver. And then with the pandemic, I mean, do you think that retailers are now relying on, obviously, putting auto and hospitality aside, but the more traditional retailers, the ones that have really adapted, I mean, how much of a driver is it for them right now? I mean, I think... You know, in terms of uh, in terms of getting their operations, and I'm looking more from the retailer perspective internally. I think it's a driver in terms of getting their technology set up there, where they're able to uh, enable you know programs such as what we talked about, buy online, pick up in store is going to be coming even more important. Uh, the curbside pickup, enabling that um, is really what's driving because I think they're seeing more and more of their shift going from in-store to online and how can they accommodate the way that the consumer wants to shop? Um, because there's, you know, as you know, there's so much competition, particularly online um, and Amazon's eating up more and more market share that these other retailers are having to figure out ways. What, how can we compete with Amazon in yeah. terms of not just products, but also the experience? Yeah, you know, they, that's a huge differentiator. I think Best Buy has done a really good job at that. Yeah over the last couple of years, you know, figuring out, okay, consumers have problem with their tech. They want to touch and feel this stuff. This is a competitive advantage. Um, yeah. I think in the grocery space, that's why Amazon bought Whole Foods, right? They wanted to have, you know, the, the you know, uh, refrigerated warehouses in high density affluent urban areas where they could ship their food from. And, you know, that was just as important to them as the brand itself. So I, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Amazon go in that space. You see companies like Warby Parker that started online and then build a strong retail presence. Yeah. And then, you know, I don't know if you saw this week, but, uh, you know, to your point about the kind of the geek squad experience at the Best Buy store, Walmart's rolling out a similar tech service yeah. program. Uh, so I think kind of, you know, the kind of the reimagining of the brick and mortar store, it's not necessarily just a place for product and transaction, but what can I get, you know, and I think we've seen some other leaders in the space. Nordstrom's a good example there. Some of the services that they put into their stores, kind of rethinking what the, the, the physical brick and mortar store means for consumers um, is going to be really important as well. Yeah. I mean, you have some companies like Tesla 
reinventing what retail looks like for auto instead of having these sprawling dealerships in the suburbs that, you know, prior to the pandemic, they were having small, you know, 3000 square foot retail locations with one car in the middle um, that you can get into. And, and you basically tons of customer service people that could talk you through what a Tesla is. And that was re kind of, so I think the whole showroom feature yeah. uh, is going to be interesting as well with retail moving forward. People miss, do miss retail shopping though. I mean, we asked people whether they're missing the most of holiday season and just as many said they were going to miss retail shopping as um, they would get together with their family. I think it's just about tradition, right? And it's about what consumers are used to doing, going and browsing the store windows and the crowds and going with their family. It's sort of like a rite of passage each year. And I think that's what they miss. So to your point, there is going to be a demand when it's safe for consumers to go out, visit retailers. Shopping is, a, is an activity for some, an enjoyable yeah. activity. But what they do during shopping what it means for the actual store. That's a whole different. So I do think there has to be some evolution for sure. Um, you know, some retailers really rely on consumers going partying, going back to like the, you know, food and beverage, beer, liquor, spirits, space, um, wine, et cetera. Um, only 2% planning going to party this year, down from 85% last year. And like brands that are, you know, trying to merchandise around New Year's, they need to rethink it because the, if you search for New Year's, um, a stock photo of New Year's, this is what you look at, right? But this is not really what New Year's is going to be like this year. So I think, um, you know, so many brands play on just the notion and nostalgia and tradition of the holiday season. They're really going to have to reimagine it uh, this year. 70% plan to stay home for New Year's celebrations. That's double last year. So that's all part of about consumers getting out. And brands are, again, starting to do things like, have experiences like, um, you know, whether it's drive in movie theaters or like a magic light celebration where people are going to be in their cars just to get out with the family. Um, that is going to replace in many instances the traditional shopping trip that, you know, the family and friends are going to have together because they can't really shop anymore. Uh, Joe, you hit it spot on in terms of home. Um, we did a webinar about I guess six weeks ago now with Domino Magazine, which really is about home decor. And we really dove deep into the trends driving this incredible boom in sales in the home home care category. And whether it's like Scott's miracle Grow for your lawn or Sonos for your home audio or Wayfair for your home furnishings, it's really been incredible to see because for so long, it was about what are we doing out of home? And it was the experience economy, right? And it was about getting people to go out and do things. And now, you know, the, the, the script has flipped, so to speak, and we are seeing companies like Wayfair explode. Um, what are your thoughts on this, Joe? And is this something that we can expect to see continue um, into 2021? Yeah, I think you'll continue to see this. I think as more and more uh, consumers spent uh, time at home, they weren't traveling to the office, they were working from home, they're in their homes, they're not going out to restaurants, they're not going out to bars, they're, you know, people are spending time at home and they're finding you know, they're not, to your point earlier about they're not spending on the travel, they're not going on the vacation. Okay, I have some extra money uh, that back again, you know, the stimulus as well. Uh, I wanted to get this project done. I can keep on putting it off. All right, let's do that. You know, let's get those floors redone or let's get that new furniture that we were looking at. Um, and it's not just inside the home too. The outdoor, you know, Home Depot and Lowe's, I've seen a major uptick in, in outdoor furniture uh, kind of outside the home. People are spending time out in their yards more than ever. Um, so there's real opportunities, Miracle, you know, the Scots, you said. Um, so I think there's certain categories. The other one I would put there, and it's kind of leveled off a little bit, but but grocery, I think, um, and which is a newcomer kind of to the online space. Uh, everyone, or not everyone, but most people, the vast, vast majority of people used to just only shop for grocery and store. Um, and we've seen sort of an uptick with the kind of first that, uh, that bulk buying, but, you know, more and more consumers, um, grocery becoming an option online too is, is kind of one of the interesting trends to come out of the last, you know, six, eight to six to eight months. You only missed one that I was surprised you didn't say, which is Peloton, obviously. Yeah. But, you know, when you look at the home, the home is now the new school. It's a new bar um, and obviously is the new gym, right? And that's why you see Peloton um, exploding this year as people look for alternative ways to work out. So I think all those companies are going to continue to thrive heading into next year. And, you know, even post pandemic, I mean, we saw Microsoft, Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft a couple of months ago, was dead set against a hybrid work from home, work from office model. And now even Microsoft, who was one of the last holdouts in the tech space, 
is starting to say, what well, you know what, you you will be able to work from home. Facebook had said the same thing, um, Dropbox, so many other yeah. uh, tech companies. And it, if that happens, consumers are going to spend so much more of a percentage of your time at home and so much less investment is going to be going into the commercial real estate space and so much more is going to go in the residential real estate space. But that's just where people are, are going to be spending their time. So that's where the money is going to flow to, whether it's through companies subsidizing people to buy a new webcam or a new desk or consumers just you know, spending money on home because they're not traveling as much or they're not going to the office as much. So I think that's going to be, I agree with you. I think it's going to be a huge category moving forward. And I think you're going to see more and more companies kind of enter that space. Um, you know, consumers right now are unsure how much they're going to spend their plan to spend this holiday season. Obviously the pandemic is one reason why um, we asked this question on Susie compared to the last holiday season, how much money will you spend on Amazon? Um, and you can see 23% and slightly more and 17% and much more. So you basically have 40% in total spending more versus 20 you're spending less. So I think it tells you all you need to know um, in terms of consumers really looking at Amazon as a place where they're going to buy so much stuff this year. And I think Amazon, even beyond prom, uh, Prime Day, is prime for a huge uh, holiday season. Um, in terms of gifting, people are obviously gifting for their kids and their significant others. Um, we're seeing companies really start to really step up the gas in the social responsibility. Uh, 1-800-Flowers recently introduced uh, the season of sharing to really benefit um, people who are suffering from hunger. And there are so many people suffering right now. And what better way for a brand to give back during the holiday season and i think it's i would implore brands to really think about ways they can give back right now i think it's going to be a really hard holiday season for so many people um so many people that that even are lucky enough to be able to pay their mortgage and pay the electric bill are just stuck at home and i think you know brands really can play a role especially ones that are, are going to thrive so yeah. let's talk about you know the categories that they're going to win so you're talking about homes so you can put that aside um we as consumers what are the must get gifts and what we heard was smartphones um, at video games, obviously there's a huge influx of new consoles coming out, uh, from Xbox and PlayStation physical games. So, you know, you saw companies like Hasbro and other companies that sold physical games, board games, puzzles have a tremendous year this year. And then apparel, any thoughts on any of these, Joe, and maybe some that are missing in terms of some yeah. like holiday season? Well, it'd be interesting. One of the ones I want to look at is consumer electronics. And, you know, back to school was actually, I think, a Best Buy reported they had almost their best back to school season ever with more and more, you know, and specifically the laptops is to your point around, you know, students being at home, you know, uh, and they're and they're buying all this equipment for the in school uh, or the um, rather the uh, in home schooling experience. So that's one. It'll be interesting to see what happens to that in um, around holiday because consumer electronics have traditionally been a huge holiday category um, has that spend already happened what will right. what, what does that mean for november and december in terms of of consumer electronic companies um and the other one uh, clothing uh it, unfortunately um i don't see again this goes back to consumers spending less i mean spending more and more time in their homes not going out to dinner not going into the office right. I don't uh, you know I don't want to be the bear of bad news but I don't see a major upswing in apparel uh, what about like athleisure because obviously Lululemon and Nike yeah. companies seem to be performing well right now I mean for sure yeah. there, there's certain there's certain sectors within the apparel the larger apparel vertical that yeah athleisure um on the on the flip side of that there is less and less the the menswear the women's wear the workwear companies they're really struggling and they're gonna have to find out ways to kind of reinvent themselves uh, because people aren't going into the office I, I you know I put on a, a collared shirt today usually um you know well, thanks for, thanks for <laughs> really right. um, but you know 99 percent of the time at home I'm not wearing a collared shirt and dress pants and you know I'm wearing t-shirt and shorts so right. um, and, and I well, think that's well, you know you might be wearing shorts right now and we'll never know <laughs> that's right yeah that's right. so and what's interesting on apparel is you know a company like rent the runway was doing so well heading into this because women just love the fact that they could get that diversity of wearing all different types of things every week and returning it and it's such a shame for them because they were really on their way to an incredible business what do you feel about the future of sort of like the rental business in apparel and the sharing economy in that space yeah i think that's another one that i i'm a little um worried about the right. um the rental um given the given the where we're at right now yeah one i will say though it, it, although i i kind of i'm going to say something that's going to maybe contradict what i just said uh the second hand market is actually uh the um uh, kind of the uh well now i forget uh Oh, the, 
the, but the secondhand clothing market oh, online. Oh, Thread, Thread up. Thread up is the company I'm thinking yeah. of. Thread up, and, and those types of companies are are, are managing and weathering this all right. Um, yeah. I think um, the specific the rent the runways, the more of the workwear. Um, right. It, that is a very uh, distinct product category. Um, yeah. Yeah, the more of the product breadth you have, I think the better off you're going to be in apparel at this point. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, Lululemon brought up, bought a company called Mirror, which is a home yep. fitness device, not not dissimilar from Peloton. So I think what the ones that are winning right now and actually have the capital are going to try to kind of create that diversity. Uh, a bunch of years ago, Under Armour bat, bought a company called Matt My Fitness. So it's about mm -hmm. merging content or hardware with your retail, uh, you know, physical infrastructure to really create that immersive brand experience and also have that recurring revenue and first party data, et cetera. So I agree, we're gonna see more of that. It will be interesting to see what happens with these video games because that's a high uh -huh. ticket purchase item, you know, so you have the new Xbox coming out, the new PlayStation, video games have just skyrocketed as well as, you know, esports and that whole space uh, this year. Is that gonna continue? I think those companies are gonna have a tremendous holiday season. I think yeah. the big turkey, and so, while you're right, I think that consumer electronic, yes, everyone's bought their new webcam by now, their new monitor, et cetera. You have the iPhone 12, you have the new Xbox, you have the new PlayStation. So, so I think all that is gonna be huge. We guys got a question uh, that I think very timely from Andrea, who said, how has uh, TJ Maxx, you know, so TJX companies, Marshall, that how they fared during this? Because it's lower priced. H have they fared okay over the last couple of Well, they, they, they've been in a tough position because uh, if you know the kind of the uh, the value sellers like the TJ, uh, TJ Maxx, the Marshalls, which are under the TJX, but the Rosses yeah. of the world, they didn't have the the e-commerce side of the house. Right. That's so, it. so they're, they, they uh, when stores were closed, they were in a lot of in a lot of trouble. Um, yeah. Now that they've slowly been able to reopen, um, you know, I, I do think that you know, in terms of price point and the value, the value purchase, that's appealing to consumers. But uh, it's the fact that they didn't have e-commerce that uh, kind of gave them challenges, at least at the start. Absolutely. So we're going to run through the rest of this uh, quickly because I want to make sure we have time for questions. But a quarter of people plan to cut back on gifts for friends this, this year. So I think this just shows the just broader macroeconomic pressures consumers are feeling. And while they may not cut back for their children or their family members, you know, don't expect a lot of your friends to give you uh, gifts this year. Only 10 percent uh, of people plan to gift co-workers uh, with fewer people in the office. Um, Susie, if any of our employees are listening, don't worry. I'll hope you, <laughs> you guys all deserve it. Um, there's definitely room left for self-gifting. Uh, you know, apparel is still there, but I agree it's more in the athleisure category and technology. Uh, you know, as we mentioned, I think we'll have a huge season uh, regard, uh, re regardless. Long distance gifting and care packages um, are starting to build because, you know, consumers really want to reach out and touch one, loved ones, et cetera. So there's companies like The Box that will do everything for you, help you pick the gift, um, have the card, really great packaging, et cetera. And I think if you think about it, a lot of, gifts given the co-workers or friends normally have been done in person at holiday parties yeah. etc that's probably not going to happen as much this year so i definitely think it creates an opportunity uh there and lastly people are eager for promotions to push them to buy and it's the usual suspects you know you have here it's interesting that sephora popped up here i mean sephora is a retailer that in some ways has really struggled with the lack of the physical retail space. Because one thing Sephora really innovated on in the retail space is the ability for women to come on and actually try uh, the makeup and try, you know, and try it on with their um, beauty experts there. And they can't do that anymore. Any any movement you're seeing in the beauty space, Joe? Um, yeah, and I'm just to, to your point around discounting and, and kind of being a, a discount brand at this point, it'll be interesting. Again, we'll go back to that stimulus discussion of whether that's going to impact kind of brands promotional strategies uh, for the holiday season. Uh, but in terms of beauty, um, I think what we're seeing is uh, growth in some product categories and and uh, and uh, and a depression in others. Uh, for example, things that, you know, with people wearing masks and when, when they do go out. So sales of like lipstick in terms of beauty have been way down, right. but, but sales of eyeliner and some other of the cosmetic products that are above, let's say, where you're wearing a mask have seen, uh, you know, so it's on a kind of on a, on a product by product level for beauty. Um, and as with companies like Sephora and Ulta that, um, where the in-store experience means so much and going in and meeting with that stuff that, you know, that's one of their major selling services is come in and get kind of get this skincare consultation, get, 
get a makeup consultation. Those aren't happening right now. So there's uh, there's that factor that have to factor in as well. What does that mean for the the beauty businesses that aren't able to have customers coming into their doors? Yeah, lots of great questions coming in. I see you, Michelle and Shannon asking really great questions. We're going to get that in a second. Um, so to wrap up, uh, before we do go to questions, um, and Abel going through the results of our S America, five key trends. First and foremost, uh, people are going to look for brands for cheer um, and charity. Uh, virtual connections are going to continue to play key role. So how can brands help with creativity, whether it's a, a, a Zoom Christmas or Zoom Thanksgiving, it's a place for brands to really um, interject themselves and get into the conversation. Uh, home is still our safe haven, going to be a huge investment. Spending a key question mark, especially for gifts, but you know we talked about there's definitely going to be some winners um, and losers, et cetera. So um, I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions. So Abel, if you want to pop on, uh, we'll quickly go through the results for S America, and then we'll jump into some questions. And you know, you know what Abel's jumping on, but one question we got that I think is really interesting with the SU uh, is, what do you feel about like that uh, home shopping network QVC category? H how yeah. is that doing? Yeah, Shop <laughs> shoppable video in itself, the kind of the model that QVC and the HSNs of the world created. Obviously, QVC purchased HSN, yeah. but uh, yeah, they've seen they've seen a nice uh, bump during the uh, pandemic, and I think. Um, not necessarily television, but just shoppable video, whether, you know, social commerce and shoppable video there. I think that's a trend that we're going to see a lot during holiday. Um, and, and we're going to continue to see that as we move into 2021. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Abel, how do we do on our questions? Awesome. So uh, in the background, just to give you guys a little bit of background, Susie, we're a real-time market research platform. Uh, and we have our own proprietary audience of people. So while we uh, started this webinar, I kind of launched the questions that you guys all were the most interested in. Uh, and one question you guys had was, do people plan on gifting as much as they're gifting others? Uh, we have some very selfish people out here this time. So uh, almost 60% of people uh, are looking to um, you know, self-gift themselves. And I was kind of curious, but you know, the Suzy platform allows you to retarget those audiences back um, so that you can dig a little bit into the why and kind of understand what they're doing. So I asked the follow-up question. Um, you know, in the previous question, you mentioned that you're self-gifting more. What are you planning on purchasing, and where do you plan on actually buying that? Um, so actually, counter I think a little bit to what Joe had said, but clothing still remains a massive thing out here for self-gifting. Um, we see, uh, you know, shoes, clothing, um, laptops in the consumer electronics space, perfumes. Um, things for their home, like uh, appliances, skincare. And then, you know, obviously you see the typical suspects in terms of where people are actually planning on spending that. So you see Amazon uh, and you see Walmart there. So uh, cool. interesting there. And then the second question really quickly is, this is a little bit surprising to me, but uh, how likely are you to see or gather with older family members during the holiday season? Um, surprisingly, we saw a large amount of people who are interested in it. Uh, and, you know, I, I again asked another follow-up question. Why, why do people not interested? And it's very much fault line. People are afraid of spreading. They don't want to, um, you know, contract anything for, for relatives. Um, and you can see here, um, you know, it poses significant health risks for your parents. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Let's not be selfish. Um, you know, relatives are in uh, different hotspots there. So kind of interesting to see how uh, consumers are, are there. And it's kind of cool to be able to retarget that back. Great. Well, thanks, Abel. So let's jump into questions if you don't mind. Love, love to hear what our audience is asking. Oh, we have a ton of, <laughs> of questions here for, for you. But one question that people have asked is um, as people are, are doing more kind of online shipping, uh, there's obviously a lot more packaging that goes into this. So, Joe, a question for you is how are brands starting to think more about how sustainability kind of plays into the equation here? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, sure. So one of the things I think they're looking at is supply chain and in terms of pro you know, product manufacturing being one area where uh, sustainability can come into play, store operations, how their um, energy supplies within their stores, um, what they're using for that, uh, I think, um, and recycled packaging. I think that's another major area in terms of the shipping materials themselves. What types of packaging are they using? Are they using recycled materials? Uh, so an opportunity there um, to, you know, those three kind of uh, bars that I would say is, you know, the product manufacturing, store operations, and then and then your packaging materials itself. Awesome. Um, one question here is uh, obviously with the rise of Instacart uh, and, you know, Prime delivery, you know, people are really using that for their groceries. So, do you see a future where groceries, uh, grocers are reconfiguring or downsizing their physical presence 
um, from an enter and shop to an arrive and pick up format and having much smaller uh, grocery stores? Joe, why don't you take that? Sure, yeah. So I, I think it's a little more difficult. When you think of the typical grocery uh, trip, you're not going and buying one or two things, which is makes curbside a little easier if you're, go, you know, you're going and buying something, a pair of uh, shoes, let's just say, and you can go and pick them up curbside. It's easy to just... You know, drop when you're getting you know eight to ten bags worth of groceries, it makes it a little more challenging. And I think consumers also um, they want to go in and kind of see the uh, you know they're less likely to touch the uh, fruit and vegetables and the produce they're looking at. But I still think there there is um, uh, you know some interest there from consumers. So I'm I'm a little less reluctant to say that that curbside is going to have as major of an impact on grocery as it is in some other sectors just for you know average order size is, is kind of my reasoning for that definitely yeah um, and then you look at a company uh, like Starbucks you know they obviously have struggled at the beginning of the year because people stopped you know leaving the house and now they're starting to slowly work their way back up but one thing they've done a tremendous job is their touchless ordering and you look at a Starbucks store now and now it's 80 percent of the people that are going to Starbucks have pre-ordered and they're just going in to pick up the coffee they're not sitting in there anymore or hanging out and they have no interest in waiting in line so Starbucks is a retailer that could really take a look at that and say well maybe we should make half of our stores just for pickup only and just have windows um, and that's completely changes the retail footprint and I wouldn't be surprised to start seeing uh, more you know companies in the convenience space or the QSR space really start looking at their footprint like that yeah and I'll add one thing to that Matt as well um, in terms of these larger department stores that are trying to digitally transform themselves that might have extra space um, retailers saving and dedicating real estate within their stores for shipments ship from store yeah. not only people coming in to buy online and picking it up in store but also shipping directly from store so we're kind of reutilizing your store associate staff to uh to fulfill online orders as well and you're going to start to see a lot of malls really start to change their footprint to be more warehouses you're starting to already hear about that because the malls have so much remnant uh you know space right now that they're going to try to put it to work Definitely. Um, so one of the things that we saw kind of come up in the beginning of the pandemic was the rise of DIY culture. Um, so uh, this person was curious how DIY culture is going to impact gifting. Do we see people making their own gift um, or, you know, give, gifting more DIY kits to people? I don't know if you've seen anything interesting there, Joe. Oh, I think, you know, we, we talked a little bit about Etsy and kind of the growth of that platform, but that's uh, in terms of in terms of purchasing. Uh, in terms of gifting, um, yeah, I mean, I think it would probably make sense as more consumers are staying in their homes and they're, they're less uh, 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 reluctant to go in store. I mean, they're more reluctant, rather, to go into store. Um, I think you could see, a, a, you know, kind of an uptick in terms of, of DIY gifting this year. It would seem to make sense. I don't have any data to back that up, but just anecdotally, I would agree with that. You, know, when you see a company like Michael's, you know, their e-commerce is up over 350% year over year. And, you know, they're about craft DIY, et cetera. So I think you definitely, with consumers having more time on their hands, I mean, some ways a DIY gift is a more thoughtful gift, right? Mm -hmm. And you're putting your creativity and heart into it. And I think the reason that consumers generally don't do that is because either they don't have the inspiration for the creativity, or they don't have the time. And right now the time equation seems to have been solved as people aren't traveling as much. So that definitely creates an opportunity. Definitely. Um, so, you know, kind of a, a follow-up here on, in terms of grocery store, in terms of the grocery, the perimeter of the store was hit hard when COVID began because people didn't want others touching their food. Do you think retailer grocers have learned enough in the last eight months uh, that a second wave won't hurt them as much? Um, so maybe Joe, if you want to take that question. I think the groceries, um, a couple different things. One, I think they're they're looking at um, delivery, and I think that's uh, at the top of many grocers' list. If they weren't already partnered with an Instacart or another delivery service, um, that is one opportunity. And two, I think they're kind of reworking their stores and reimagining the layouts of their stores for for enablement of things such as buy online, pick up in store. Uh, specifically, I think uh, you know there's protocols in place for you know I think. You know, if if your if your doors are open at this point, you've had to have some sort of safety protocol measures put into place. So I don't think uh, uh, people are going in and touching produce and fruit and other things that, uh, or at least they shouldn't be. Um, you know, at this point. Definitely. And kind of one follow up question there is that what are the implications for food and beverage brands for the holidays in terms of promotions? Um, do you think they should have a different kind of 
uh, you know, response to how consumers are shifting their mindset and behavior? Like, what are some of the considerations there, maybe for some of our F and B partners? Yeah, I think I think that they need to really start looking at themselves as ingredient brands. So start to, you know, I think consumers have more time at home. They're going to be doing more Zoom or virtual celebrations. The brand needs to be part of, and you look at the overall shift in, especially in, in the beverage space from on-premise consumption to off-premise consumption, meaning drinking their, their drinks at restaurants and bars and nightclubs to doing it at home. So I think, you know, having an ingredient brand, pushing new ingredients, new recipes, new ways for you to use their products in innovative ways around the holiday spirit, I think is a great way for them to drive incremental volume. Yeah, I'll give you one example. We just, this is a, a perfectly timed question. We did something with uh, Sir La Tabla, the uh, cookware brand, um, and they had uh, they have their in-house chef presenting on a Zoom doing a cooking class um, and obviously using Sir La Tabla products. So the people that are turning in, so, you know, are, are seeing the cookware that they're using and that's a way to drive uh, purchase activity. So that's a great example of what Matt was just referring to. Excellent. Um, so Matt, this is kind of a question for you as a former agency CEO. Um, but any information on how you know agencies can best support their clients during what uh, is going to be a very busy, busy Q4 and all, all the uncertainty that's happening? I mean, I think it's the same way we're supporting everybody right now. I think that brands need inspiration. Brand needs insights. They need to understand their consumer. And any way that you can offer them value in that regard is going to allow you to get closer to your clients. Um, and using Suzy is a great way to do it, to be honest with you. We have a lot of our agency clients using Suzy to conduct thought leadership and retail, uh, thought leadership and webinars and reports for their clients to drive deeper engagement. I think content is a great way to deeply engage and add value to your, to your customers during a busy season. Definitely. Um, and, and maybe Matt, since you, you brought up Suzy, do you want to explain a little bit about what Suzy's audience is that was answering some of those questions that I showed earlier? Sure. So Suzy has its own proprietary panel of over a million U.S. consumers that um, we can segment by a variety of census-based criteria. They're on always on gamified application called CrowdTap, which allows us to tap into them and, and, and gain insights and feedback from them in real time at any time is uh, able so eloquently evidenced during a webinar today. Awesome. Um, so another question here is how are convenience stores doing um, given the rise of e-commerce? Uh, well, I, I would say um, the convenience stores, obviously not in e-commerce. To your point there, that there's they're they're not uh, infrastructure set up for the e-commerce. But um, with more and more consumers on the roads, I think there's an opportunity to, for convenience stores uh, to see some uptick there. Especially as I, I don't know what I think it was around seventy percent or so, Matt. You said around holiday travelers expected yeah. to go via private vehicle. I'd be interested to see some, and I don't have the data around specific holidays. Um, whether convenience stores that also sell, you know, obviously gasoline, but, um, you know, drinks and snacks and stuff. Uh, I think there's an opportunity there with more and more consumers driving. Yeah, especially we did our last week's webinar was about Halloween and change in Halloween, obviously is a huge driver for the confections candy category and convenience stores is a huge channel for them. Um, there has been some recent legislation in California, which is removing candy from the checkout aisles, which is a huge place where they merchandise. But if there's going to be more traffic um, in the convenience stores because more people are driving mm -hmm. uh, during the holiday season, then maybe that's an opportunity to make up for some of that value. Yeah. Um, it's kind of interesting. We have a few questions about travel here. Um, so this is more of a hypothetical, but Matt, what do you think are the implications of COVID and kind of this flexible work slash learning schedules on the holiday travel schedule? Um, do you think people are going to be elongating some of those trips or what might that look like? Yeah, I think just like how this the traditional calendar for shopping has now been completely thrown out of whack with, as we spoke about during this webinar, Prime Day um, is now in a different complete different place. And Cyber Monday is going to be more spread out over a longer period of time. I think holiday travel is as well. I think some people are going to look at holiday travel as a way to get away for six weeks or, uh, you know, two months. I think Airbnb uh, is going to be a huge beneficiary of this. I think you're going to see their volume go through the roof as people feel more safe in renting a home than, than staying in a hotel. So I think Airbnb is going to be a huge be uh, beneficiary, but I think that the calendar will for certain change. Definitely. Uh, and just one final question here. So uh, how are consumers weighing social issues this year in terms of their gifting purchases? What are they looking for? Um, you know, are they looking for a company that is ethical or socially responsible? Or have you seen that start to play in a crazy in terms of kind of where they're actually allocating some of their dollars? Um, so maybe Joe, if you have a, a thoughts on that. 
Yeah, I think this is another trend that we saw in previous years, but it's really been accelerated given this some of the events of this summer, kind of the racial equality and uh, events that we've seen, and, and kind of the push for racial racial equality and the need for brands to kind of espouse their values. Consumers are looking to purchase from, with again with so much competition in the market. If you know all things are equal, I want to buy from a brand that that, is, that shares common values with me. So uh, you're seeing brands that you know whether it's. Um, you know, some of the racial uh, justice movements they've taken, the steps there, sustainability is another major area that we got a previous question on. So I think uh, it's more critical than ever for brands to kind of be out, be out front and center with kind of um, corporate social responsibility initiatives. That's right. Couldn't agree more. Cool. Well, I want to thank uh, everyone for joining. Once again, don't forget about next week's uh, first ever State of the Consumer 2021 Summit, which is on October 27th at 1 p.m. Um, Joe, thanks so much for joining. You have a tremendous amount of insights um, on this space and ones I know that our clients and our audience really loves. And we'd hope to have you maybe back again in January to do maybe a post-mortem on the holiday season if you're interested. And I just really appreciate your time uh, during this busy season. So thanks so much for joining. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Abel. It was, uh, this was fun. Yeah, it was great having you. Um, and I want to thank our audience, Abel, to you and the team as well for putting all this together um, and our, our great team at Suzy. So on behalf of myself, um, Joe and Abel, thanks for joining and uh, we'll see you all next time. Thanks, everyone. Take care.